Medical Board of California. Today's date, April 19th, 2018. And uh, we would like to call this meeting to order. Thank you. Ms. Lawson? Dr. Bolat? Here. Dr. Conadab? Here. Dr. Kraus? Present. Dr. Levine? Here. Ms. Pines? Here. Do we have a quorum? Thank you. I would like to introduce our uh, Judge Perlman, who will be presiding over this session, these sessions. And with this, uh, I will turn it over to her for our next uh, oral argument and before we begin. Thank you very much. So um, I am, we are on the record before the Medical Board of California in the matter of the accusation against Dennis Stolpner, MD. Medical Board Number 800-2016-025732, OAH Case Number 2018-031246. As was indicated, I'm Lori Perlman. I'm an Administrative Law Judge with the Office of Administrative Hearings, and I've been asked to preside over this hearing this morning. Um, we did have the panel members identify themselves for the record, and um, I am told that we do have a quorum this morning. So that being accomplished, I will now take the appearance of counsel. I'll start first with the Deputy Attorney General. Good morning, Your Honor, members of the board. My name is David Carr, Deputy Attorney General, representing complainant in this matter. And could you s spell your name for the record, please? It is C-A-R-R. Thank you, Mr. Carr. Thank and then for respondent. Good morning, Judge Perlman and members of the board. My name is Peter Osinoff, spelled O-S-I-N-O-F-F. -F. Thank you. And do I see that you have Dr. Stolpner with you? I have the privilege of having Dr. Stolpner on my left. Thank and you. And good morning to you as well. Okay, so the board in this matter has issued an order of non-adoption of a proposed decision by an administrative law judge and has decided to determine the matter itself upon the record, including transcript and exhibits and written and oral argument. And um, we will have discussion this morning in regard to that. If I am uh, understanding correctly, the process will be as follows. Respondent will have 15 minutes to make an opening argument. Complainant will have 15 minutes for a response. Respondent will then have five minutes for closing and complainant will have five minutes for closing as well. Is that everyone's understanding of what was intended? Very good. And uh, we will have to strictly enforce these time limits. As I'm sure you're aware, the arguments have to be based on the existing record cannot exceed the scope of the record of duly admitted evidence and no new evidence will be heard. The panel members may ask questions of the parties to clarify the arguments, but may not ask questions that would elicit new evidence. The ALJ and any panel member may ask a party to support the party's oral argument on a matter with a specific citation to the record. At the end of the oral arguments by counsel, I'll offer the respondent physician an opportunity to address the panel regarding the matter. If the respondent elects to address the panel, um, I will place Dr. Stolpner under oath. After oral argument, the board will go into closed session to deliberate. The parties will not receive a decision today, but will be receiving it in the mail in the future. And the board has already had the benefit of considering this matter and uh, reviewing what has been submitted. And with that, I will now turn to respondent to make an opening argument. Thank you, Judge Coleman. Uh, sorry, uh, Your Honor? Yes. Can I have you actually put the mic, like bend it down for you? Is thank that you. better? Yes, thank you, Counsel. Oh, okay, That's, uh, no problem. Uh, Sometimes I think my voice is loud enough, but uh, it is my privilege to speak on behalf of uh, Dr. Stolpner in this licensing matter, uh, wherein the administrative law judge uh, issued a probationary license uh, to Dr. Stolpner. Now, who is Dennis Stolpner? 
uh, and I refer to him as a doctor because he is a physician licensed without restriction in the state of New York for the past five years and in the state of Florida for the past three years. His family lives in California and he wants to practice medicine here. He is a man of science having graduated from University of California at Berkeley uh, with honors in molecular and cell biology and he's a person with great caring and compassion for others. He received glowing evaluations from his deans at New York Medical College who described him as, quote, very bright, committed, and mature with consistently exceptional performance in general surgery and, quote, throughout all of his clinical assignments, he has earned substantial praise for his enthusiasm, dedication, professionalism, fine work ethic, team spirit, and impressive learning attitude. He also has exemplary interpersonal skills and wonderful humanistic qualities. That's in Exhibit F at page 5. During college and medical school, he was the Los Angeles Regional Coordinator for the Department of Chernobyl Recovery, calling attention to a, a disaster which had dramatically impacted the people in his native country of Belarus. Uh, while in school, uh, he did research both at Cedars-Sinai here in Los Angeles and at UCLA uh, that resulted in publications, and he volunteered at the Los Angeles Free Clinic and at the Mattel Children's Hospital. Since his termination from the third year of his OBGYN residency, he worked as a physician in a pediatric clinic in Argentina in 2016, and while there, he intensively uh, studied and learned Spanish, uh, which prepared him to serve better a large portion of the California population. Last year, he volunteered his services as a physician in Guatemala. He studied more than 175 hours uh, two years ago to become nationally certified as an EMT. Uh, last year, he put that training as an EMT to good use in Houston uh, after Hurricane Harvey, uh, where he volunteered his services. He also recertified in uh, basic life support and in ACLS. Also last year, he worked as an MA uh, medical assistant in offices at, at Olympia Medical Center and received letters of support, which were found in exhibits EE and II, from physicians whom he shadowed and with whom he discussed cases, and I'll quote, demonstrating a strong knowledge base in medicine, specifically endocrinology, rheumatology, and cardiopulmonary disorders. That's at Exhibit EE. The physicians noted that he was able to communicate uh, both in Russian and in Spanish with patients in their native tongues. He was said to be kind, compassionate, respectful, and understood cultural nuances. He's the kind of person that we would want as a physician in California. So why deny a license to a person uh, like Dr. Stolpner? Three grounds have been advanced by the Attorney General's office, uh, but basically there is only one uh, advanced was really a ground for denial of a license, and that is uh, the ground of incompetence because he couldn't complete his third year of his OBGYN residency at Lutheran Medical Center in New York. The other two grounds are not argued as grounds for denial, uh, but they are uh, grounds for consideration. And the other two are that he had a DUI six and a half years ago, uh, and uh, the third ground is that he was uh, grossly negligent in denying uh, that his DUI case was pending when applying for licensure in New York five years ago, resulting in a reprimand from the state of New York. I'll address each of these points. Uh, first, the ALJ uh, found correctly that there was no incompetence uh, as a physician as a matter of fact and law shown in this case. She found that the failure to complete the third year in OBGYN residency doesn't mean that Dr. Stolpner is incompetent to practice medicine. Of course, licensure requires completion of at least one year of postgraduate training at an ACGME approved program with at least four months of general medicine. I had it wrong in the brief, I'm sorry if I said two years, uh, but throughout the whole case, other than that, it was one year. Uh, two years for foreign medical grads, but he's not. Uh, Dr. Stolpner completed three years of postgraduate training. One year at UC Davis, 
uh, in a pre-surgical uh, uh, residency, and, w and he was invited to proceed with the surgical residency, but he wanted uh, to uh, go to, into OBGYN. And so he transferred and spent one year at SUNY Downstate, State University of New York, Downstate Long Island College Hospital in OBGYN, uh, another internship or first year residency there. He then transferred because that institution, uh, SUNY Downstate, was losing its accreditation. He transferred to Lutheran Medical Center uh, for the second year of OBGYN residency, which he also completed. Um, and he passed all three steps of his USMLE. He more than met the minimum qualifications for licensure, having had uh, three uh, years uh, in which he uh, passed uh, postgraduate. Um, that, was the, that was the testimony of the only expert witness at the hearing, Dr. Richard Johnson, who has been on the faculty at UCLA for 24 years, uh, 21 of those years having been involved in the residency program and serving six years as the residency program director in family practice. Could you spell the expert's name for the record? Sure. Uh, Richard Johnson, or Johnson, J-O-H-N-S-O-N. Thank you. Dr. Johnson testified that uh, becoming a specialist in OBGYN is different than becoming a physician and being licensed as a physician. Board certification or completion of a residency has never been required uh, um, in this state or in any other state that I know of. Uh, there is no evidence in this case of any <coughs> egregious behavior or egregious unprofessional behavior. There is no medical record or testimony that shows incompetence as a physician. Uh, not having the independent clinical thinking and clinical judgment required of a PGY-3, a third year resident in OBGYN, in a particular residency program at Lutheran Medical Center in New York doesn't determine the competency of a physician. The Attorney General's Office introduced a few poor faculty evaluations, and that can be found in Exhibit 10. Um, I will, this is Exhibit 10 uh, of, in the record. We introduced evidence at Lutheran Medical Center of many, many more uh, satisfactory or better <coughs> evaluations. So the, the, there is uh, not a one-sided, uh, um, uh, negative review of Dr. Stolpner in this case. Um, now, the, uh, the program director himself, at the end of the second postgraduate year, which is actually Dr. Stolpner's third postgraduate year, counting the one at Davis, uh, rated his performance satisfactory in seven out of seven categories by the conclusion of that year. Even in his third year, which he didn't, the one he didn't complete, the one he was terminated from, he was assessed at the PGY-3 level or better in half of the 28 categories in which he was assessed. In another 11 categories, he was assessed at between level 2 and 3. And in the three remaining categories, he was assessed uh, at a second year residency level, which would be plenty for licensure. This is found at Exhibit N, pages 4 to 12. One of his faculty members from SUNY Downstate wrote a letter of support for him in glowing terms, noting his excellent fund of knowledge in OBGYN and that he is an adept surgeon and a caring physician, very hardworking and thorough. He was briefly placed on probation toward the end of that year, but he, was, he passed that year uh, after improving his CREOG scores quite a bit. It was said by that physician at SUNY Downstate that, quote, he works well under pressure. That's an exhibit FF. Another physician who helped, who helped train him at SUNY also wrote a letter of support in exhibit JJ at page 10. Even a physician at Lutheran Medical Center at JJ at page 11 wrote a letter of support during his second postgraduate year there. The language in his residency termination letter suggesting that he, quote, should consider opportunities in a non-acute clinical setting, 
it's Exhibit P, has been seized upon by the Attorney General's office to argue that it's unsafe to license Dr. Stolpner in California because there's no way to prevent him from practicing in an acute setting. I agree that all physicians work in acute settings, at least from time to time, but Dr. Stolpner, remember, was said to work well under pressure, and since his residency, he became certified as an EMT nationally, so he can and has functioned in acute settings. The most that can be concluded from his termination is that Dr. Stolpner couldn't make it through his PGY3 year in OBGYN in the Lutheran Medical Center residency program. Not that he can't handle any acute care cases, nor that he can't function in a hospital, but not in an OBGYN uh, program through his third year. When it licenses physicians, the board doesn't determine practice parameters for a physician. The, prof the profession determines those parameters. Dr. Stolper is not going to be credentialed at any hospital as an OBGYN unless he completes a residency in that field. Likewise, he's not going to be permitted uh, to perform neurosurgery or cardiothoracic surgery or any surgery. As a licensing body, this board doesn't involve itself in determining what privilege privileges should or should not be granted to a physician. There is no basis in this case for imposing any restriction upon him, much less to deny his license, for not being allowed to complete his third year of a residency program. Now, as to the DUI, that occurred six and a half years ago on a weekend night, not in connection with work whatsoever. And even the Attorney General's office has acknowledged that Dr. Stolpner is simply not a substance abusing physician. He complied with the first offender programs, the DUI was expunged. The evidence is that he drinks only very modestly and has had no problem before or since without any substance. For that matter, this was his only scrape for the law in his, with the law in his entire lifetime. So there's no reason to place his license on probation for a six and a half year old DUI. Not even New York disciplined him for his DUI. In New York, he was disciplined for not disclosing the pending DUI charge on his application for licensure uh, to that board more than five years ago. Uh, the New York discipline was a reprimand. Dishonesty wasn't charged. He was charged with gross negligence in answering an application question. The ALJ was correct in that there is no evidence to support dishonesty in this case. New York discovered, in fact, New York discovered Dr. Stolpner's error on his application. When Dr. Stolpner himself revealed his conviction on his license renewal application to New York, he also revealed his conviction on his applications to California and to Florida. He revealed his conviction to all of his employers. In fact, he revealed the DUI in answer to every question except for that one question in the New York application when he didn't have a conviction but when his license was pending. You have three more minutes. Thank you very much. There is no reason to deny a license in California on this basis, particularly when New York itself found that a reprimand was sufficient. A license denial or even probation would be purely punitive. It would be a mistake to deny Dr. Stolpner a license in this state. He has a great desire to practice here and would serve the people of this state well. The issuance of a license would also give him a chance to complete a residency program as he testified he very much desires to do. The issuance of a five-year probationary license is unnecessary to protect the public in this case. He's maintained a deep knowledge of medicine during the past two years, taking many CME courses and shadowing other physicians. There's no evidence of any knowledge deficiency, even during the final year of his residency program. Knowledge was not at issue. If the board is concerned about Dr. Stolpner's limited practice history during the past two years, a five-year probation is certainly not the basis for protecting the public. Instead, the board should issue a license with a clinical evaluation. We call it PACE for short, but, uh, but something like that program. He would need to comply with the recommendations of the program, and that can be enforced without any probationary requirement, which would only serve as an impediment to his being accepted in any practice or training program. In fact, this board could could issue an order that he gets a license, but as a precondition even to practice, more a precondition to practice, he needs to, he needs to uh, successfully complete 
the clinical evaluation program after the license is issued. Uh, and uh, he is willing to do that, and, and that would be the appropriate uh, resolution if this board has any concern uh, about Dr. Stopner's uh, uh, continuing ability at this point uh, to enter the practice of medicine at this time. And thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Osinoff. Okay, Mr. Carr, now is your opportunity to uh, respond. I shall take that opportunity. Thank you, Your Honor. Members of the board, good morning. Thank you for hearing us today. Dr. Stolpner's counsel is correct that the fundamental and prime issue before the board today in not adopting this proposed decision is that of Dr. Stolpner's competency. Competency, as you're well aware, extends beyond the mere parameters of technical ability or knowledge and must include, of course, critical thinking and clinical judgment in the ability to safely discharge the responsibilities of a licensed physician in California. The administrative law judge, in rendering her decision, created an artificial distinction in order to find that Dr. Stolpner uh, is appropriate for licensing in California, finding that his failings at two residency programs where his practice was most closely scrutinized in a setting approximating that, more closely approximating that of actual clinical practice was deficient, the um, administrative law judge decided that that did not rise in her terms, uh, the failings demonstrated did not rise to the level of incompetency for discipline purposes. She also noted that the termination letter issued to Dr. Stolpner by his second OBGYN residency program at Lutheran Medical Center in New York does not state that he's incompetent to practice, quote, in her terms, general medicine, but recommends that he consider opportunities in a non-acute clinical setting where they termed, uh, they proposed he may have more success. If California allowed a two-tiered medical license, one of which was a lesser license that permitted limited amounts of practice in a structured, controlled, protected environment, then this level of competency, what the ALJ terms general medicine, might be appropriate. However, as you're well aware, that is not the situation in California. The license is a general license which is offered, uh, which is bestowed upon clinicians who have demonstrated proficiency, skill, and knowledge to a degree to warrant confidence in their ability to safely practice. There is nothing that would restrict Dr. Stolpner from practicing in an acute setting. It's true he might not be accorded immediate privileges at some acute care hospital, but he could do outpatient surgical um, facility work. He could do uh, any number of medical um, procedures that require a level of ability, knowledge, and judgment that Dr. Stolpner has not demonstrated and manifestly has failed to be able to demonstrate at two successive residency programs. That level of competence not being demonstrated, there's no reason to have confidence in Dr. Stolpner's ability if given a license here to practice medicine generally under all manner of situations. Dr. Stolpner's counsel suggests that five years is too long a period of time. I would suggest that if the board believes there is reason to believe that Dr. Stolpner may be an appropriate candidate under appropriate settings, that a five-year period of probation is the absolute minimum, not only because that is what is, <clears throat> I beg your pardon, what is recommended, um, required, mandated by the disciplinary guidelines, <clears throat> but because it is a reasonable and logical minimum that would allow a period of effective oversight and mentoring, particularly if the other aspects of the disciplinary guideline requirements are imposed. The ALJ did not require two uh, additional um, conditions of probation that would be absolutely necessary to promote and foster Dr. Stolpner's successful practice of safe medicine in California. That is, that he pursue additional continuing medical education above the minimum required, 
and most essentially that he be required to have a, pro, a practice monitor, a physician who would be allowed to both mentor and um, oversee Dr. Stolpner's practice on a longer term basis in order to provide that level of assurance for the board that would be necessary to know that Dr. Stolpner is practicing safely. Do you have a suggestion of how long the practice monitor should be in place? I would say a minimum of three years. And that would be contingent, of course, upon the successful um, reporting from the uh, practice monitor that he is uh, competently and safely practicing medicine in an environment that tests and determines his ability to practice in a wide variety of circumstances. The failure to impose those conditions leaves the public exposed. The necessary guidelines at a minimum require this when competency is questioned even in a licensed practitioner who may have been practicing for years, when we have a physician who's not been practicing in California, that wager, that gamble, the risk in, entailed in giving him an unrestricted license is unwarranted. The, the necessary minimums are imposed because of the cumulative experience of the board in developing disciplinary guidelines over decades. And that minimum level not only establishes a meaningful precedent for the board, but is the logical and necessary minimum in order to ensure safe practice when competency is questioned. Dr. Stolpner's practice as an EMT, while admirable and worthwhile and relevant to the practice of medicine, is in no way equivalent or synonymous with the practice of a physician licensed to do all things physicians are allowed to do in California. I would suggest that if the board believes that Dr. Stolpner is an appropriate candidate, that at a minimum, the five-year period of probation be required with all of the standard conditions. PACE, which again is, a, is an admirable program, but it is a snapshot. The clinical education program offered there or at any other, um, by any other entity, is a necessarily time-limited exposure to Dr. Stolpner. I would suggest that the more effective determinant after successful completion of PACE would be the practice monitor, a physician who is putting her or his own reputation and ability on the line in mentoring and overseeing Dr. Stolpner. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so Mr. Ostinoff, you now have five minutes. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, had Dr. Stolpner applied for licensure following his year at UC Davis, uh, he would have been granted an unrestricted certificate, an unrestricted license by this board to practice medicine in this state. Had he applied after the second year at SUNY Downstate, he would have been granted an unrestricted license to practice in this state. Had he applied and left the residency after his first, after his, uh, second year of his OBGYN residency, he would have been granted an unrestricted license to practice in this state. It is not a ground for discipline that a doctor can't complete a certification, a board, a uh, residency program, uh, or the third year of a residency program in particular. Uh, if a doctor went back and got training and couldn't do it, and fell flat on his, his or her face, then they wouldn't get a restricted license or be disciplined here in the state of California. So he, he had three years after which he could have been, and he was certified after by Davis and by uh, SUNY Downstate um, as competent and able to practice uh, in this medicine uh, for the purpose of licensure. He would have been able to practice without restriction of any type in this state. Now, uh, there was no finding that he's an incompetent physician by, uh, e even at Lutheran Medical Center following his third year. Uh, with regard to PACE, uh, PACE, as you all know, uh, makes recommendations uh, as if uh, they, they do get a snapshot, but they also make recommendations uh, as to what doctors need to do 
And uh, we have all seen doctors who have been asked by PACE or recommended by PACE to enter certain programs uh, or to be evaluated in certain ways. They make recommendations and this board uh, adopts those recommendations in the form of an, of an order and can do so and uh, orders the physician to do whatever PACE recommends. Uh, if this board has any concern, and again, our first line position is that there is no basis to issue any type of a restricted license in this case since he passed through three times the amount of postgraduate training than is required. Uh, it, but if there is board feels that, well, we just want to be sure because um, is he, uh, uh, we just want to be sure, does he have enough medical skills and knowledge at this point uh, to function as a physician? Make him go through PACE. Give him a license, order him into PACE, but a five-year probation with other terms and conditions that, that, may, that present great impediments to a, a doctor, particularly one starting out and trying to get a, a job uh, with someone else or trying to get into a residency program. Uh, a a five-year probation or any probation uh, creates enormous impediments for physicians, uh, and there's no reason to have a probationary uh, order in this case. Um, if, uh, if this board uh, uh, feels that he needs to be evaluated, PACE could do a very good job and can make the recommendations, and this uh, court, this uh, uh, medical board can enforce uh, that order by issuing a, um, a, 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 an order to the physician to follow the recommendations of PACE at this point. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ostinoff. Mr. Carr, was this a statement of issues and not an accusation? Yes. Okay, I, I need to correct. Uh, at the beginning, I believe I said accusation. Let me uh, correct that. This is a statement of issues. Okay, Mr. Carr, whenever you're ready, you have five minutes. Thank you very much. Members of the board, Dr. Stolpner's, Dr. Stolpner's counsel is correct that he would have been eligible for a physician's and surgeon's certificate if he had applied after his um, internship year. He did not. And what we have now is more and better information about his inability or the concerns about his inability to practice safely, which are brought forth after the scrutiny afforded by the grueling and close review of his clinical practice in a day-to-day -day setting in an ongoing residency program rather two residency programs. At the first, Long Island College Hospital, he was placed on probation in his OBGYN residency program, quote, due to academic and clinical deficiencies. That program closed at the conclusion of his, Dr. Stolpner's first year, so that matter is inconclusive and left uncertain. More certain, however, is that from uh, the situation at Lutheran Medical Center in New York, where he was restricted from patient care in 2015 after finding by the Clinical Competence Committee that he should not be promoted to the next year's postgraduate training level. Attempts were made to remediate his ability and level of uh, skill, knowledge, and competence. Those were unavailing, and he was terminated from the program. He appealed that. A full hearing was held upon the appeal, and the, his appeal was denied. He remains terminated from the program. The two successive programs that found him deficient in his clinical abilities and knowledge are worth noting and they are before the board and they cannot, should not, must not be ignored. It is therefore incumbent on the board to ensure his safe practice by imposing reasonable and limited conditions on his license if he's gonna be given a probationary license at all, which should include, again, at a minimum, a five-year period of probation with appropriate oversight by a practice monitor <clears throat> upon successful completion of a clinical education and assessment program such as PACE. This is the minimum required by the disciplinary guidelines. It should be the minimum that the board finds necessary to ensure safe practice if they believe Dr. Stolpner is an appropriate candidate with the potential to be a safe and competent practitioner as a physician in California. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carr. Um, do any of the board members have any questions they would like to ask? No. 
I'm seeing uh, heads shaking, so uh, I'll assume not. And um, would Dr. Stolpner like to address the board directly? Well, I, I think I've spoken on, on his behalf unless the board has any questions. Okay, I see that they appear not to, so this will conclude the arguments in this matter. The record is closed, the case is submitted, and we will be off the record at this time. And uh, the panel will deliberate in closed, closed session, so I'll ask that individuals clear the room. Thank you very much. Thank you much. very much, Dr. Uh, Perlman, members of the panel. Good morning. We are at the uh, Medical Board Panel B meeting of April 19th, 2018, and we are going to open the session. And today presiding is uh, Judge Perlman, and we will begin uh, by taking roll call, please. Ms. Lawson? Dr. Bolat? Here. Here. Ms. Pines? Here. We have a quorum? Thank you. I'd like to, again, uh, Judge Perlman will open the session for us and she'll be presiding over all matters. Good morning, everyone. We're on the record. It is April 19th, 2018 at 9.32 a.m. We're in Los Angeles before the Medical Board of California in the matter of the remand of administrative mandate upholding the accusation against Syed K. Zaidi. Hopefully I've pronounced that close to correctly. Um, MD, Medical Board case number 02-2013-231 663 OAH case number 2018-031-242. As indicated, my name is Lori Perlman. I'm an administrative law judge with the Office of Administrative Hearings, and I've been assigned to preside over this hearing. Um, we've established that there's a quorum, but for purposes of the record, I'll ask each of the panel members to identify themselves and um, spell their name for the record. So I'll start with Ms. Pines. Denise Pines, D-E-N-I-S-E, P-I-N-E-S. Dave Garnadev, D-E-V, Dave Garnadev, D-N-A-N-A-D-E-V. Sorry, can you guys get the microphone? I'm sorry. Oh, thank you. Trying to read at the same time, talk to you. Dave Garnadev, D-E-V. Uh, first name, Ganadev, G-N-A-N-A-D-E-V. Hi, good morning. Michelle Bolat, M-I-C-H-E-L-L-E, B as in boy, H-O-L-A-T. Howard, H-O-W-A-R-D, Kraus, K-R-A-U-S-S. Sharon Levine, S-H-A-R-O-N-L-E-V-I-N-E. Thank you. Okay, so at this time I'll take the appearance of counsel and I'll start first with the Deputy Attorney General. Good morning, Your Honor. Mara Faust, that's M-A-R-A-F-A-U-S-T, Deputy Attorney General, appearing on behalf of complainant, the Medical Board. Good morning, Ms. Faust. And for respondent? And then with you, you have respondent. It's S Y E D, Sayed, last name Zaidi, Z A I D I. Thank you very much. So the board in this matter. Um, is dealing with a remand to reconsider the level of discipline in this matter. And to that end, we will have oral argument. The process and time limitations will be the following. Respondent will have 15 minutes to make an opening argument. 
Complainant will have 15 minutes for a response. Respondent will have five minutes for a closing argument, and then complainant will have five minutes for closing as well. Is that the board's understanding? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. And uh, these time limits will be strictly enforced, and the arguments must be based on the existing record and shall not exceed the scope of the record of duly admitted evidence. No new evidence will be heard. The panel members may ask questions of parties to clarify the arguments, but may not ask questions that would elicit new evidence. The ALJ and any panel member may ask a party to support the party's oral argument on a matter with a specific citation to the record. At the end of the oral arguments by counsel, I will offer the respondent physician an opportunity to address the panel regarding the penalty. If uh, the respondent elects to address the panel, I'll place him under oath. After oral argument, the board will go into closed session to deliberate. The parties won't receive a decision today, but be, will be receiving it in the mail sometime in the near future. And um, with that, we will proceed to arguments, and we will begin, as I indicated, with respondent. Thank you very much, Your Honor. Good morning, members of the board. Although it did not begin that way, this is now a very simple case. The board has found that Dr. Zaidi engaged in repeated acts of negligence with regard to two patients. And the basis for that finding is that he had failed in two patient examinations to adequately protect the modesty of those patients. The facts that support those causes for discipline are set out succinctly in the board's decision. With regard to the patient with the initials RG, the relevant finding is in paragraph 82 of the decision, which states in pertinent part that Dr. Zaidi then told RG to stand up and turn around. She was wearing a cloth gown and drape. She had just had a breast and pelvic examination and was naked under the gown. While respondent was performing a skin inspection, RG felt uncovered, naked and exposed, and respondent provided little to no explanation for what was happening. For RG, she was standing nearly naked before respondent for no reason. The second patient is JER. And with regard to patient JER, the board's findings are stated in paragraph 84. And the relevant portion of that paragraph states as follows. JER was in nothing but a vest and drape when respondent was standing in front of her, pushing and pulling her legs closed and then open, exposing her naked vaginal area to him. Following the musculoskeletal examination, M.A. Eichenberg left the room and respondent asked J.E.R. to stand and turn slowly around while respondent completed an examination of her skin. With only a vest to the waist and a drape to cover her lower half, J.E.R. was functionally naked before respondent. As J.E.R. turned, she exposed more of herself. Undoubtedly, respondent moved the vest and drape, as is his custom and practice, to view different areas of JER's skin, which left JER even more exposed. Finally, summarizing the violation in paragraph 91, the board found, in the case of RG and JER, respondent's conduct fell below the standard of care. His behavior was incorrect. In addition, respondent seemed oblivious to the patient's perspective but not devious or intentional. As such, respondents' behaviors can be corrected with proper counseling and education. The board's disciplinary guidelines with respect to repeated acts of negligence suggest that the minimum discipline would be five years of probation, but in the case of a single patient, suggests that in appropriate cases, a public reprimand can be adequate. In this case, 
we provided to the board a summary in Exhibit E of Respondents' Evidence that sets forth for two quarters public reprimands that the board has deemed sufficient in order to protect public safety where there were two or three patients. Now, Ms. Faust in her argument had suggested that we had somehow tried to cherry pick or pick out particular decisions, but I would really disagree. What I'm all, all that we're really trying to do is to suggest this board has to make the decision in every case on the unique facts and circumstances what is necessary to protect public safety. Those decisions were provided as an example simply to say that the board has found it recently appropriate on certain fact situations, even when there are two or three patients involved, that it's adequate to protect public safety in repeated acts of negligence cases where there are two or three patients. And I would say that this is exactly that kind of a case. In the board's words and the findings, the errors that were committed by Dr. Zaidi can be corrected with proper counseling and education. And the record in this case is very clear that Dr. Zaidi began making changes in his practices, taking steps to learn about how to better interact and communicate with patients immediately after the complaints that were made by RG and JER back in the year 2013. And he has continued diligently that education and more recently in the past year on probation, psychotherapy, counseling, to cure this knowledge deficit. Dr. Ty Arnett was one of the witnesses who testified at the hearing. And he was the physician who supervised Dr. Zaidi for the last year that Dr. Zaidi worked at the University of California at Davis at the Carmichael Clinic. And he specifically was asked and testified that Dr. Zaidi is a good doctor. But Dr. Zaidi had some deficits in his view with regard to his communication style and how he interacted with patients. And these are the questions and answers that he gave on that subject. And this is his testimony from April 7 of 2016 at page 48. Question, can you describe for us your assessment of Dr. Zaidi's demeanor when he was with patients? Answer, I thought he was a bit stiff, if you will. Question, and would you describe him as being personal with patients? Answer, personable, but maybe not personal. Question, what does that mean? Can you explain it to us? Answer, that means very professional in spoken and written action, but not really getting into the story with the patient so that you break down barriers. Patients are very nervous when they come to see a physician, and you can sense that if you know the patient. And so part of what we try to do is break down those barriers so that you can really find out really assess, is there something else going on? You know, what am I missing? Now, Dr. Zaidi testified that he began to make significant changes in how he interacted with patients because of his extreme concern at the complaints that had been made by patients RG and JER. And the record reflects that Patient RG, he had actually seen at a prior clinic just a couple months before, and he had seen patient JER very shortly after he arrived at the Carmichael Clinic. In paragraph 80 of the board's decision, this change in his practice is acknowledged. The board said that he testified that he changed his behavior after he was informed of RG's and JER's complaints about his full skin examinations. Thereafter, respondent modified his practice and did not stay in an examination room alone with a gown female and asked patients whether they wanted a full skin examination as part of their physical. During the course of the hearing, we presented testimony from two of the medical assistants that worked with Dr. Zaidi in the 
approximate year that occurred between when these complaints, or I'll say when he saw the patients, and when he left the Carmichael Clinic. The first of those two medical assistants was Shannon Hartman. And Ms. Hartman had testified on April 7th of 2016, and she was asked these questions and answers beginning at page 132 of the transcript. Was there ever a time where there was a patient that was dressed in their street clothes and that Dr. Zaidi needed to look at part of their body and he would have you come and chaperone those examinations as well? Yes. What kinds of things would Dr. Zaidi ask you to chaperone when the patient was in a gown and was in their street clothes? Answer, he would buzz the light and in the room there is these little buttons that you press it chimes into the nurse station so if i was available or someone else was available we would come immediately to the room because it flashes we would go to the room we would turn the light off and depending on you know what it is you know he would say you know show me the spot some patients would show like their upper arm they would pull their sleeves up so their arms or or if it's their shoulder you know their shoulder Sometimes it was their legs or their pant legs, and he would have them pull up their pant legs. When you worked with Dr. Zaidi, did you think that he respected patients' modesty? Answer, yes. And did he explain to patients what he was doing and what the purpose of his exam was when you worked with him? Always. How would you describe Dr. Zaidi as a doctor? Answer, I thought he was a wonderful doctor and I was very proud to work with him. I think his patients were very proud to have him as his doctor. They continue to tell me that. I see them often. And he was very respectful and, you know, very much a patient advocate, always trying to make sure they did their labs and kept them on things that they weren't keeping up with for themselves. The other medical assistant who worked with Dr. Zaidi during that period of time was Linda Cattell. And she also testified on April 7th of 2016. Could you spell her name for the record, please? Yes. K-I-T-T-E-L. Thank you. Beginning at page 159 of the transcript, she was asked, when you describe Dr. Zaidi having to come in to look at a patient's arm, were they in street clothes? <coughs> yes. I saw them in both ways, both in street clothes and in gowns, yes. Did you, did you have an opinion that Dr. Zaidi sh used chaperones more than any other doctors? Answer, again, for things like normal women types of exams, those things, no. That is a standard practice. I expected that. For things like the different kinds of skin types of checks, yes. Then, yeah, there were much more than the other doctors. Okay, was Dr. Zaidi kind of, I don't want to say famous, but did people, did staff talk about Dr. Zaidi being more needy of medical assistants and chaperones and other doctors? Answer, I don't know that I would necessarily call it needy, but I think, I think I would probably characterize for myself, it seemed unusual that we would go in for those different kinds of things because it wasn't typical. It was atypical behavior. And so the record is very clear that from the time that these complaints were made, Dr. Zaidi began working hard to ensure that he had someone with him during a skin exam, even if the person was not in a gown and a vest, to ensure the patient's modesty. And we also have from that medical assistant her perception of how thoughtful he was and how he had began to communicate with his patients in the year that followed the time that he had seen RG and JER. You have three minutes. Thank you. Dr. Zaidi has continued those efforts. As you know, in the record, Exhibit B, Dr. Zaidi went to a PACE physician communication course even before the hearing in this case. Dr. Zaidi um, testified at length and there were exhibits that were presented regarding the books, articles, and things that he was doing to work hard to understand how to better communicate with his patients. Dr. Zaidi in this case provided to you a short video that explains the concern that he has for these patients, what he has learned from this case, and what he has been doing over the course of the last year 
to ensure that he is fit to practice and that he has learned from this mistake. You also know that he's been seeing Dr. Greenberg, which was a condition of his probation, and Dr. Greenberg, in the declaration that has been submitted, says the following. Dr. Zadie has taken this process very seriously. Dr. Zadie has kept every scheduled appointment and has never been late. He has been completely compliant with all aspects of treatment. In particular, Dr. Zadie has been extremely open and forthcoming in discussing the underlying facts and his current situation. He has never been defensive or evasive. He acknowledges his shortcomings and has been eager to explore and learn from them. Dr. Zaidi has demonstrated insight into his behavior and has used our time together to work on improving his communication skills and empathy. Dr. Zaidi has expressed genuine concern for the patients who file complaints against him. Although he disputes some of the conclusions about him, he has always acknowledged the legitimacy of the feelings, concerns, and consequences experienced by his patients and, in fact, has shown more genuine concern for them than for himself. Your this, time is up. Thank uh, you. Did you want to say one more sentence? Yes, thank okay. you. This is a good doctor and a man who has taken to heart these lessons, and a public reprimand is adequate to protect the public. Thank you, Mr. Wishick. Okay, I turn to the Deputy Attorney General now, and you have 15 minutes. Thank you. Good morning, members of the board. This hearing is a remand to reconsider penalty. Originally, the judge also found that there were inaccurate records in that the respondent said there were chaperones present for these two patients when there weren't. What the judge also said, though, was he didn't intentionally um, make the record inaccurate. And you need intent for it to be a deceptive record, and that's why the judge struck those counts. So we have this inconsistent ruling no chaperones, but he didn't intend to mislead in his record. So the remand now is to say, what's the penalty on these repeated negligent acts for the nearly naked skin exams, but without the issue of the record keeping? Now, JER came in to see Dr. Zadie for uh, peeling skin on her toe, and the next thing she knew, she had to wear a paper vest and um, it was a paper vest and paper towel, and he would not let her keep her underwear on. In that getup, he did expose her vagina to his view, and she was very uncomfortable with that exam, given she came in for a peeling toe. RG came in for a well woman exam. The next thing she knew, um, she was down to, uh, again, a vest and paper blanket. She did have a uh, breast exam, but she was asked to stand up and turn around in a nearly naked uh, fashion. She said she was naked. The husband said he, she was holding a blanket. The judge said she was naked under a gown. In any event, the question is, why was that, given it was a well woman exam? As the court has instructed you, um, you need to look at only existing evidence. Respondent has attempted to supplement this record wildly with exhibits A through E. Um, let's first go with the exhibit that you can consider fully, which is exhibit A. You're allowed the only supplementation really you can consider is what is the respondent's attitude and what has he done in the interim in terms of a compliance with probation. So exhibit A is his declaration as to what's happened in the interim and that's fair game. You can look at that. However, what he says is while he's enrolled in PACE, he hasn't done PACE because of this four month extension. Um, and he then mischaracterizes that four-month extension. Now, perhaps he's confused. The four-month extension was either um, from the board's denying the peti from the superior court denying the petition. This is a uh, email that's attached to his declaration. Commencement of the judgment of the superior court denying the petition, or 
the effective date of the board's decision after remand, whichever occurs first. So what occurred, uh, the petition was denied in part on November 3rd, 2017. Technically, that means the 120 days ran March 3rd, 2018. So that begs the question, why hasn't he done and completed PACE, given that the first event is the ruling on the petition? And, you know, we'll hear from him, presumably, in his response on that. But that's an issue. He has not done PACE. He's enrolled, but hasn't completed. As to the other attachments, there are two groups. Exhibit D and E, you can't consider at all. This is an attempt to supplement the record. It's not relevant, uh, and you basically need to exclude it, and I'm going to move at this point that you exclude Exhibits D and E. Exhibit D is the declaration from Dr. DuPont, who was respondent's expert at hearing, Clearly, the ALJ did not go fully with Dr. DuPont's opinions since she found violations, and he said there were none. He does not now get to recharacterize, gee, they didn't ask me X, Y, and Z at hearing. The hearing record is closed. He doesn't get to opine now. And he exhibited bias at the hearing because he also counseled Dr. Zaidi on communication issues and yelled at him, had counseling sessions, not the normal role of an unbiased expert who's merely reviewing the record. All of his statements in that new declaration have nothing to do with what occurred at the hearing. Would Exhibit you call, E. Um, oh. Dr. Pond's name for the record, please. Oh, Dr. Dup it's uh, okay. So his spelling. Let me just. I I've got it here. Actually. Alan A L L A N Pont P O N T. That's Thanks. Exhibit D. Exhibit E which talks about other PLRs, there's actually case law that allows you to exclude it, not just did he or didn't he cherry pick other cases where a public letter reprimand was found. It's the case of, and I'm going to misspell this, Pig, Piggus or Piggus, P-E-G-U-E-S, the Civil Service Commissioner or Commission, 1998 at 67 Cal App 4th, 95. With penalty, there's no requirement for an agency to consider similar penalty for similar misconduct. And in fact, uh, you do not need to, the, the penalties don't need to correlate. And of course, in this case, as we pointed out earlier, the facts on these other cases don't relate as to two of the five relate to female physicians having to do with OBGYN issues, and the other PLRs have to do with overprescribing. None of them have to do with a failure to maintain modesty in skin exams on female patients. So again, we would move to exclude Exhibit E as well on other penalties and other contexts. Now as to Exhibits B and C, we would move to exclude in part. Exhibit B, it's fair to see what Dr. Zaidi has to say about his attitude today. That's the first third of that CD video. But the back two thirds are his wife uh, attempting to improperly supplement what didn't happen at the hearing. She initially complained in a criminal context about his conduct and then took the spousal privilege and refused to testify at hearing. She does not now get to raise new issues after the fact as to his character when she refused to participate and protect him at the hearing. So I would ask that you exclude and not consider anything that his wife has to say in Exhibit B. Exhibit C is uh, Mr. Greenberg, PhD's declaration. He is not a doctor, he's a PhD. And we actually have a statute that says we don't necessarily refer to PhDs as doctors in formal hearings. And he can testify about his view of Dr. Zaidi's therapy. That's fair game. He cannot testify about the psychiatric evaluation that occurred in this case, because he's not a psychiatrist. He cannot testify about the need or ability of PACE to, to cause rehabilitation. 
as he is not a psychiatrist. We would move to strike paragraphs 8 through 11 of his declaration and caution the board to, um, I know that in respondents' uh, briefings, they refer to him as Dr. Greenberg. He is a PhD. Uh, so with respect to the record and some of the other comments, I would just like to point out that Dr. Arnott, who uh, Respondents' Council pointed out, testified at the hearing, was supervised by Dr. Slapnick, Kurt Slapnick. Could you who, spell both of those names? Oh, for the okay. Ar Arnott or Arnett, I may be wrong. I may need help from co-counsel. I think it's A-R-N-O-T-T? Okay. And Dr. Slapnick is S-L-A-P-N-I-K. Under our further recommendation for remand, we cite that in his interviews with Dr. Zaidi, he had the impression that these um, skin exams were full-on naked skin exams and that he was counseling Dr. Zaidi on how to do them more properly, just exposure bit by bit. Um, and that's his testimony on page four and five of my supplemental further recommendation. Uh, and the court seems to have disregarded that testimony because she didn't find that they were full naked skin exams, to, despite UC Davis finding that they were full naked skin exams. In addition, while we have testimony from third party chaperones later saying they're always there, we had uh, the chaperone M.A. Eichenberg E-I-C-H-E-N-B-E-R-G, who was present for part of J-E-R's exam, uh, but that she was told to leave and that Dr. Zaidi spent a, a, some additional time with the patient when she was naked under basically the vest and, and drape, the blanket, uh, and there was some time when they were there alone without a chaperone. And again, that testimony is also included, I'm not going to cite it again, under the further recommendation for remand. Now, the other things to consider are that in the last two years, even though Dr. Zaidi has been otherwise compliant with probation, he has not been practicing. So we do not have any clinical picture of him since these events and he has not passed pace. So the real issue is, is he essentially trustworthy with female patients at this point in time, and what do our disciplinary guidelines require? The ALJ on these two negligent acts felt that five years probation was appropriate, Probation is still appropriate on these repeated negligent acts under the disciplinary guidelines. If the board feels that because the dishonest record keeping is gone, that discounts the period of probation, you can appropriately consider three years as opposed to five years. But it's also well within your power to still assert a five year probationary period. That's up to you within your discretion. Uh, given that he hasn't practiced, given that he hasn't completed pace, given the nature of the conduct and his lack of sensitivity to these patients, I would argue probation is the only appropriate uh, discipline here. Uh, and uh, I think that's all I have unless there are questions. Let me. That's our position. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think we'll hold the questions until we complete uh, okay. the oral argument unless the board prefers otherwise. Okay, they're okay with that, all right. So I will turn things back to respondent at this time and you'll have five minutes. Thank you very much, Your Honor. With regard to the testimony by Dr. Slapnick, as Ms. Faust points out, the judge rejected that and found that the patients were gowned and draped. It may be because in his testimony, which took place on June 6 of 2016, at page 37 of the transcript, 
what he said when he was finally asked, is it possible you were mistaken in what you understood that Dr. Zaidi had said? His answer was, it's possible. And Dr. Tai Arnott was present at that meeting and testified that he never heard Dr. Zaidi say that the patients were naked when the skin examinations took place. With regard to the what's been characterized as new evidence, what we are calling the evidence on remand, there has been no citation that has been provided to the board to suggest that that evidence should not or would not be considered by the board with regard to the motion to exclude it. We provided the board with a citation to the Court of Appeal decision in Toyota of Visalia Inc. v. New Motor Vehicle Board and in that case, this is what the court said verbatim. Evidence of good behavior, good practices, and lack of dereliction, as well as other evidence relevant to the issue of penalty, is properly admitted at the hearing on penalty, even though a long period of time has transpired between the findings of violations and the hearing on the penalty. There is no question that each and every one of the exhibits that have been submitted by Dr. Zaidi goes to the appropriate penalty that should be imposed in this case and goes to his attitude toward and hard work to remediate the knowledge deficits that he had. And for that reason, and under this authority and no other authority has been provided to the board, all of that evidence is admissible and should be given the weight that each of the board members believe that it is entitled. Uh, I want to be clear. I'm not suggesting that there are similar facts. Anytime you have a deviation from the standard of care, each and every circumstance is going to be different. And those earlier cases that were offered were only to suggest that similar to the guidelines that the board uses, the board has recently seen some two and three patient cases that are appropriate. It is entirely within this board's determination and discretion whether this is that kind of a case. The last thing I simply want to address is I'm a little stunned by the suggestion that Dr. Zaidi has not complied with the PACE program. The email is before the board. The agreement was when the writ is rejected or there is a decision after remand. Here, we had a hybrid, which may not have been anticipated by counsel, which is that the writ was granted in part and it was denied in part. And the whole purpose now is for the board to reconsider what the appropriate penalty <coughs> should be, and that is why it is appropriate for him to wait until after the remand. The writ was granted in part, and it's come back for remand. And for that reason, it's appropriate for Dr. Zaidi to await this board's decision. He has done every single thing, and then much more than what the board ordered. The additional CME that he has done is about twice what he was required to do under the board's order. He has complied with every condition, and he has done so in an open and honest and thoughtful way, as is reflected by the declaration of Dr. Greenberg. And so for those reasons, I feel very strongly that this is a case that is appropriate for you to issue a public reprimand, but to require Dr. Zaidi to do one of the PACE courses that was recommended or ordered in the original order, and that is the PACE course that relates to physician and patient boundaries. Sorry, physician and patient? Boundaries. Boundaries. Thank you. And your time's up. Thank you so much. And uh, back to the deputy for uh, five minutes. Okay. Um, the board also needs to deny respondent's motion for a further hearing. He's asked in his papers that this go back to the ALJ to hear a variety of um, issues. And that is the, beyond the scope of the Superior Court remand order. The Superior Court remand order says this has come back here merely to reconsider penalty on the existing record. And so the board needs to be very clear that's all they're going to do. We're not going to go back and do new hearing time. And so again, we need to strike 
declarations D and E and parts of B and C and determine this on the record. All of the conditions that are in the ALJ's original decision should remain in effect and probation should be the imposed penalty. Thank you. Thank you very much. Did the board have any questions? Yes, I see uh, we have one. Would uh, you identify yourself for the record? Howard Krauss. Does Dr. Zaidi wish to address the board directly? Yes, sir. Can I? So let me go ahead and swear you in then at this time. Sure. If you'll raise your right hand, do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you very much. You can begin when you're ready. Can I sit down? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity again. I was before the panel uh, over a year ago. I believe it was January 2017. My uh, probation started in March of 2017. Um, many things have happened since then. I wanted to update the panel about that. Uh, but first, I uh, want to apologize to these patients. Uh, I did that in my first appearance to the board as well, and I want to do that again. Uh, these patients, what they've gone through was distressing, was painful when they saw me as uh, their physician, and uh, I'm sorry for that. I, uh, I want to convey to these patients, their families, and to the board that I have done every possible avenue, I've taken every possible avenue, I've done everything possible to, to basically you know, do something about this shortcoming, this problem that I had in terms of how I was interacting with the patients. Um, it could be the CME, it could be the courses, the books, um, and then certainly for the last year, uh, Dr. Greenberg has been a very helpful source. Um, my therapy has uh, primarily focused on different things that, you know, um, that can help in making the interaction as a, you know, uh, something that the patient can actually start trusting the physician. Um, it could be the, uh, the active listening. It could be uh, small things like how you meet and greet the patient. Um, it, it could be your body language. It could be your eye contact. And certainly I've worked on uh, the skills of empathy and, and mindfulness. Um, I have been a stay-home dad for, uh, for the last three years, and uh, that ha I, it was a kind of an opportunity to spend more time with my kids. Uh, I have four kids, and, and uh, certainly I applied the, the theory of uh, empathy and mindfulness to uh, them as when while I was interacting with them, and I can tell you that it has created a bond um, uh, that I've never thought that, you know, it could exist. Um, my wife sometimes feels jealous about that. Um, I uh, have been, one more thing that I want to uh, talk about is I've been to back and forth to Pakistan uh, for, um, because my parents have been sick and um, my father was diagnosed with esophageal cancer. My mother had a stroke. This was all happening back, back and forth. The point I'm making it, uh, that was the time that I first felt how does it feel like when you are sitting opposite the doctor? And uh, my father was actually refused by two or three oncologists initially that they are not going to treat him. And I can tell you that experience was horrible, the, the feeling of helplessness that comes. And, and so this was a first-hand experience. I had discussions with uh, Dr. Greenberg about this, and that has actually you know, given me more uh, confidence in terms of the mindfulness, how you basically think how, what the patient is thinking. I have done everything uh, uh, in, in terms of uh, making sure that this would never ever happen again. I, uh, I'm absolutely receptive to whatever decision you guys make. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you. Did the board have any additional questions? I'm um, seeing uh, they do not. So at this time, we have completed the argument phase of our matter, and I will close the record at this time. The case will be submitted, and uh, I thank everyone.
We will deliberate in closed session, so we'll have everyone clear the room, and we're off the record. Thank you.